Good afternoon. How are you? Welcome along. Inspire and be inspired. Another motivational conversation. Today we are talking to a true legend in the game, one of the UK's finest, now firmly relocated down under. You can see his website here on the screen. Photo genius, the one and only Mr. Paul Farris is going to be talking to us all the way from Brisbane on this wonderful Tuesday morning for him, Monday evening here on the Costa Blanca. Let me begin by welcoming along all the crew who are joining us bright and early, and uh, we're gonna have a lot of questions. Let me make sure that I can get Paul onto the screen to make sure all is rocking and rolling. Just getting straight into it this morning, mate. I wanna make sure that everything is working fine and there's no issues. How are you? I'm great, thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, mate, it's an absolute pleasure. You look incredible and you sound wonderful, as we would <laughs> it's expect. It's good lighting. <laughs> well, <laughs> we would expect it, really, from a man of your calibre. Uh, we want to begin by saying a shout-out to a lot of people who may be uh, more familiar with yourself from your uh, photo genius work, right? Um, yeah. Uh, a fantastic website. You offer numerous courses and, of course, a really strong um, YouTube channel. But uh, you and I go back way, way before photo genius was even a thing. Uh, and I actually look forward to finding out how that did come about. Uh, I can see people are joining us bright and early on our Facebook and on our YouTube. So you know what happens, Paul. We try to make this as interactive as possible. I'll start by asking the people who are watching us if they have any questions or they want any shouts for Paul, then please do feel free to uh, leave a message. And when there's a break in the conversation, I will direct him. Uh, to the comments, but I'm sure he's got a cheeky eye on a screen somewhere there reading all the other comments, right? I, I can see people starting to, uh, yeah, to get on board, Wonderful. which is good. Yes, great. Uh, you are our guest for this evening, and of course, you're going to bring them in in their droves. So well, let's just <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> let's just get into this and uh, start from the beginning, really. As as I said earlier, our paths crossed due to the music, and I'd like to find out in this short interview as much as I can about your journey uh, in the music game. Uh, so I think you need to tell us what part of the UK you're from, when you were born, and uh, life growing up for yourself around that time. Okay, so I was born in Twickenham, um, which the Aussies here, if they've heard of it, they only know because of the rugby ground. Otherwise, most people don't know where Twickenham is. Um, we lived in Twickenham when I was small for a number of years. My dad was from Richmond. My mum was from Twickenham. Um, and then we moved out to to Surrey as, as kids. And um, growing up, music was always around. My mum and dad, who are still around, were very uh, much music fans. Um, lots of Motown um some philadelphia tracks um amongst you know general 60s music which my dad loves and i've inherited a love of 60s music and just music in general really so there was always always music around the house mm -hmm. okay so you have um, to forgive me i'm i am listening but my attention is flitting all around this screen just to make sure everything is still working absolutely you That's may fine. have actually said but it escaped me what year were you born and did you mention brothers or sisters 68 i was born okay yeah 1968 um i had a brother his name was tony uh no, no longer with us sadly okay um, so it's just just the two of us Mm -hmm. And as I said, music was was always around. Um, absolutely loved music. Um, started off collecting seven inch singles. Um, I guess probably just liking whatever was in the charts at the moment as a kid. And then uh, later in my school years, I started getting into um, the whole sort of two tone scene. Absolutely love that. The specials, the selector, the beat, all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, my my dad has, well, I've now got um, some old sort of reggae, blue beat type tracks and things as well, which is great. Um, so, yeah, always around music, always loving music. And um, I forget when it was, but um, I got interested in the idea of playing music and sharing music. That's something I really love to do. And uh, my parents bought me a pair of twin decks when I was, oh, God, I don't know, I was maybe 14, 
13 so quite young okay and um yeah did a did a few little parties and things playing music playing tracks um and that's kind of how it all i guess it all started mm-hmm. so yeah. um we hear the same story i repeat it time and time again when we're interviewing people you say coming up through um the two-tone the scar movement and then uh it would have progressed into the new romantic into the hip-hop into the uh, Ab- absolutely you know. yeah you say yeah like i think uh electronic music um was big and um and it ha- has inspired a lot of dance music artists as well so obvious ones being depression mode human league you know that kind of stuff um lo- loved all that um first concert ever i'm not embarrassed to say was the thompson twins okay <laughs> that was that was just brilliant loved it i'm know? fairly certain so, i uh, along the way I may be wrong, actually. I, I amass so much knowledge, I always get it mixed up. Were they from Sheffield, maybe, or maybe not? Um, or am I thinking Look, of, I think no. they may have been originally, but I believe when they started really getting things together, they they were living in a squat in London somewhere. Okay. Now, maybe, you know, I'm, get, were, maybe I'm getting twisted. I'm getting them mixed up. Sheffield's with the, Human League, I think, isn't it? Human League. That's it. Yeah, yes, I, think, yes, yes. I think Sheffield is definitely the Human League. And maybe Heaven 17. I think there was quite a scene in Sheffield. Probably just as much hairspray consumed amongst them all. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely, possibly. (laughs) Okay, so So, um, um, first concert and age 14, 15 going out and spinning. Yeah, because we lived we lived in Surrey. We lived in a um, quite a way out of town. So going to the the first concert was was quite a big deal. That was at Hammersmith. What was Hammersmith? Um, Not Palais, Odeon, maybe then, you know, the, the venue in Hammersmith. Um, and I went there with my mate Clive, who's was out my best mate at school, and weirdly enough, lives not half an hour from where we live now, which is really strange. So I still get to hang out with my school buddy Wonderful. even now. Is that um, just by sheer coincidence, or did you follow him, yeah, or did pre- he follow you? I look, no, pretty pretty much by coincidence, really. He he relocated to New Zealand for a number of years. And then the business, there was a business opportunity in Australia, which he took. Um, and he just happened to be in Brisbane. And uh, we moved out here to Brisbane um, a number of years ago and and um, had a phone call telling him, well, oh, we were in Brisbane, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I think you're about 20 minutes from me. So it was just, it was really quite bizarre how it's worked out. But yeah, it's great. Fantastic. So hanging so, around um, with you, pal. Do you continue with the story? Yeah. Sorry. So left school, um, oh, my, my, my memory, Andy, for dates is really bad, but I think 1984. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't quite know what to do, but I did know that I wanted to be involved in music in some way, shape or form. So I got a job at the local record shop, which suited me down to the ground. So I spent quite a lot of time in there anyway, buying records. By this time, I was getting into, um, you know, I, get, I was buying street sounds albums and, and um, getting into dance music a little bit more and soulful type stuff, not having much money, but job at the record local record shop. So he helps to solve that. Um, and I was there for a number of years. In fact, I think I was there for about eight years okay. um, working initially on what they used to call the YTS scheme. I don't know if you remember that youth training scheme. I do. I do. Which was a government thing. 45, yep. so 45 quid a week. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, 45 pounds, pounds a week. I nearly said dollars. And um, I was working there five, four days a week. I think one day a week I would go to the local uh, tech college. Um, and uh, and they were good to me there. They gave me a little bit of extra money to help me along. And it was, it was great. I probably spent all my money on records anyway, as you do. Uh-huh. Um, but it was fantastic. And it was a store that's just sold, you know, pop music and, the, and chart music. Um, and also looked after a lot of the local DJs. So there were importing records as well, um, which was great. And then the record shop became a record and video shop. So half of the half of it became a video store when, you know, VHS videos and everything blew up. <laughs> so pre sky days. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was good. And as a family, we, the, the guy that owned the, owned the shop, his name was Simon. So it was called Simon's records. Um, he sold and our family brought the, brought the store. So, so we had it until I think 92. Okay. So um, Neil Carr mentioned 
Simon's records in Yately earlier. So obviously That's he was it. he's uh, on the ball there. The big up Neil, yeah. thank you. Uh good evening to everyone passing through, to Jimmy, to Chetan, to Bobby, uh to Mr. Jefferson, Chris Holmes, and to Pogwash as well. As I say, anyone that's with us, I will say hi a little later on. Don't want to break up the flow of the conversation too much. Okay, so uh the timeline working in the, the record store. Uh, this would have took you into the, obviously we would have been well into the house movement towards the, the back end of the 80s. Then. Ab yeah, absolutely. So um, dance music had, had by this time really, really blown up and I was really starting to get into it. Um, so I was making regular trips. I was jumping in the car, making regular trips to a place called Greyhound Records, which was in Battersea which some people might know it was a distribution place. So they, they distributed import records and, uh, or they had all the white labels and all that. So Friday was always a good day to go up there. So I jump in the car, drive up to Battersea, which was a fair trek from where the store was. Um, and just fill the car with, you know, what I thought was the best of the best, really white labels and, uh, us imports drive back down, and, um, we, you know, within a short time, there was always a little crowd of people waiting on a Friday afternoon to see who could get the, you know, their hands on the best of the best, really. So it was, it was great. And we put some, some Technics decks in the shop. Um, and by this time, I guess I was, yeah, really starting to get into house music in particular. Um, I mean, I've always loved all types of music, but house music was really starting to take hold so doing a few parties putting on a few local events nothing too big um but but fun you know mm -hmm. um have to give a shout to my mate ian larry leggett at this stage because i met him through the store he was a customer and he invited me to come and play he had a gig at a local pub i can't remember what it was but i went there and played with him and then we started doing a few things together um locally um yeah, there was a lot going on around around there at the, at the time. Um, so that shop, Simon's, um, closed its doors in 92 um, for a number of reasons. One of the big one, ones being um, rece the recession was starting to hit. I mean, things were starting to really slow down in the UK around then. Uh -huh. So buying buying music, well, buying CDs and things, you know, it was a bit of a luxury item. There weren't things that people needed. So there was a real downturn in trade. And also remembering that half of the store was videos. By this time, Sky had come along and people were starting to move towards satellite and watching things that way as an alternative to going out to the video shop and renting a video. So sadly, we closed in 92. Okay. I bet Blockbuster was still going strong, though, in 92. That was a big favourite oh, of mine. Yeah, ab abso absolutely. <laughs> they they hung on for a number of years, I'm sure. Uh, they they Yeah. But they're gone now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember when. So let me ask you, you, you know, happily skipping along into 1992, we've missed a huge chunk of the rave culture. Did you get involved in any of that uh, and all that came with not, it? You know, Not directly, um, really. We, I mean, I went, I went to a few local, local events. We used to be a ticket outlet for some of the gigs. Okay. I can't remember the names of them now. You know, they always had amazing flyers. Um, and we used to sell tickets for them. So these people were coming, some of these guys were coming through the stores. Um, I wasn't, the hardcore scene was really quite big, which I kind of, I pre, I appreciated, but I wasn't really overly into it, but there'd be a few little illegal ra raves and things going on locally. Mm -hmm. Um, my brother at the time, who was a big fan, reggae fan, he, he really started getting into the rave scene. So he was disappearing off at all hours, going off to these parties around the M25, which was quite fairly local to us, the south side of the M25. Um, yeah, I went to a few local things. Um, there was a, a pirate station going on nearby, so we were. I was doing things with them. We had a gig going on at another local pub, which was always rammed. I think that was on a Thursday night, and I'd, I'd do guest spots on this radio station. I think it was called Radioactive, but again, the memory's shot, man. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. <laughs> Okay, so so ninety two and the and the store closed down. What what was next for you? So um, so I had a little bit of time off really after that, um, a few months to try and work out where I was going to go, and I think I got talking to somebody at a at a club, a local club called Pantiles in which is in Bagshot, um, and this guy was um, a distributor, so he was distributing 
records. So a bit like Greyhound Records. It was mm-hmm. basically the same sort of setup, importing stuff from the States. Um, and then he had, I think, two vans at the time going around to all the record stores and selling all the product. Uh, they were called CD and AV Supplies, a weird name because I don't remember ever having any CDs in stock and I don't remember any audio visual gear either. But um, yeah, there was a lot of stores that when, when I realized there was a lot of stores that they weren't reaching out to. So I pretty much made a list of all the stores and one day got in touch and said, look, if you want, I can help reach these stores, you know, hook us up with a van and uh, and I'll do it. And that's what that's what happened. I, I, I was I thought, why not? I'll ask them. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think a couple of weeks later, I joined them, um, had a van and was driving around some of the record stores. But what was a real lucky break, I think, for me is that the the guy that was doing the West End, the Soho round, um, going to all the big stores in London, um, I think he'd had enough of just driving around with the West End and actually gave me his van and said, just do the West End. So I did. So I was driving around supplying Catch a Groove, Black Market, City Sounds, Unity, Zoom, Wild Pitch, all those great record stores that are sadly now part of part of history. Um, and it was great. I'd drive up to Heathrow Airport, back up the van, get the stock on, drive straight to Soho and just start selling music. And did, and, did you um, get yourself a reputation of as having a great ear? You know, people knew... Did you take pride in being able to get certain titles or, you know, just being able to get other things that people couldn't get? Well, to be fair, you know, so it, I wasn't the I wasn't the buyer for them. So I had no sort of real say in what was um what was what was being stocked or what I was selling. So at this stage, no, not really. So, okay. so you know, props to the guys that were, were buying in the stock. But I guess I would have given feedback on what the buzz tracks were or what people were asking for. Yeah, because um, I'm, just, I'm, just... I'm in my mind, I'm thinking forward a few years to some of the mm. distributors who did used to open up the back of the van and say, right, we've got this, this has come in, I've got this for you, whereas you were literally just picking up ordered stock. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, mm. you would get promo packs. So they would, um, you'd pick up the records from Heathrow and in, the, in there was usually a sealed packet with a few a promo copies of what might be out in a few weeks time. Mm-hmm. So there was the opportunity there to listen to these tracks. And obviously from that respect, I guess I would have been saying, yeah, this is a great track. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's you know, weird actually. Sorry to cut you off as I'm talking sorry? about further on down the years, thinking of specific distributors, Andy Marriott pops up and says, big up Andy and Paul. <laughs> and mean, he's a great uh, guy. Uh, what yeah. a legend. What an absolute yeah, legend. Absolute legend. And every time I mention him, I'm going to put him on the spot. I've asked him several times to come and join me on one of these interviews, and he declines every time. But I'm going to keep badgering him because he's got some Do stories, it. right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Your friend Ian is here. He's saying, Hi, fellas. I'm locked. I was struggling to see the live through Paul's post originally, but glad we've got you. And Stuart Goodfellow Staples says, Great to see you, mate. Love hearing these stories. Fantastic. So, so Stuart, Stuart's my uh, my main man, lives just down the road from me, another guy from the UK, and we, we do a few little events and things locally together. Wonderful. Top guy. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, uh, forgive me for interrupting your, your, your story. All. We're still in the van yeah. then, driving around Soho. So, yeah, so I did, did this for, look, again, memory's terrible. I would guess probably about 18 months maybe driving around. Um, and it was, it was great. So I'm getting to know the guys behind the counters. They're getting to know me and it, it was, it was a really good time. I really loved it. And also getting to know my, my way around the West end and Soho, a place that I absolutely, you know, adore. Um, and any, and anyway, the guys from CDAV supplies tells me one day that they're, he, they want to open up a record shop. Um, and there was a guy called Izzy who ran a record. He ran a record store. It's one of the record stores that I distributed to. It was just off Petticoat Lane in London. And um, John from CDAV Supplies and Izzy were going to team up and open up a record store. So common misconception is that it was my record store. That's very common. I think even yourself may have said, you know, that yourself sometimes. Um, no, I, I, possibly. I, I don't know a lot yeah. to be fair. <laughs> 
the reason for that, and I've never said it was my record store. The reason for that is because I was always there. I mean, I was there all the time, and and I guess a lot of people knew me. So I was for a lot of people. I was kind of the face of Uptown, and I did all the promotion and various things, which I'm sure we'll get to in a moment. Um, so for that reason, a lot a lot of people assumed that I was, you know, the the guy behind Uptown, but I wasn't. I just I was there from day one. I put a lot of work into it. I looked after things and became, the, I guess, the manager really um but anyway they uh, decided to open up a record store and then they decided they're going to open it up on darbley street if you don't know darbley street it's right in the heart of soho and the the site the the building was at the other end of the street to black market records which is you know a legendary record store in london um so quite a brave move really because there was just around the corner there there was catch a groove there was um i think Z unity records there was a whole heap of record stores already in soho to so to come along and say we're gonna do a dance music store right in the heart of soho surrounded by record stores that have been established for years and years was i think a bit of a brave move really um but it worked so i was there from day one um i I guess they were keen to have me on board because I'd already worked in retail as well, had the record store previously. So I knew how that sort of stuff worked. Um, yeah, we moved in. I, I remember painting the walls. I remember designing the Uptown logo on a scrap of paper at my mate Ian's house. Um, I remember um, getting the sign organized to go above the door. So I was very much involved, which again is why people often think that I, maybe it was my store. And, and so uh, was, it your, was it your decision to um, have the, the two floors and split a real strong split between? The no, no, because the there was already um, we had. So there was there was John and Izzy who were the guys back in it. And, and you know, they owned the store. There was myself. Uh, and then we had Ronnie, Ronnie Harrell. Um, uh, there was a guy called Big Al as well. Um, and and I guess early on, we decided that we'd have soul. Um, R and B upstairs, um, bit of hip hop as well, and then downstairs will be the house basement. Just trying to get the sound downstairs, you know, because mm -hmm. we're always we're always going to be the noisy of the two. Uh, and the store opened up in ninety four, and um, it did really well from day one. I mean, it was just a great location. I guess that was partly it. Nobody knew us, nobody knew the name, but um, very in a very short space of time. It started doing really good business. I remember actually by this time, sadly, Catch a Groove, which was a great store, had closed down. That was just a few streets over. And um, another store, or another team had moved into the building and they called themselves, they were Downtown Records. And there was a lady that ran it. Um, I think her name was Linda. Anyway, she wasn't very happy about Uptown Records opening up just around the corner. Um, and I can quite vividly remember getting the word that she was saying, oh, they're going to be closed in a few weeks. They're not going to last. But we we did. And they closed a few months later. <laughs> so Karma. there you go. Karma. Yeah, so yeah. Let me right. just draw a uh, reference to a, a couple of comments. We've got Lenny Fontana passing through, same oh, Paul Ferris. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Pogwash is asking, was Steve Wren there and also Matt White at some point? Possibly. Uh, hold yes, that thought. See, I'll go. come back to. I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, Andrew, Mr. Marriott says, "Uptown, it should be said, changed the Soho way of presenting music to the public. One of the first places to have listening decks in that area." And uh, Boogie is drawing reference to Red Records that was close. And Chris Williams, who uh, is, definitely knows a lot about Soho, passes through and says hello. So, hi everyone. Thank you for being here. Sorry, uh, you were going to comment about Steve Wren and Matt White. Absolutely. So Steve Wren, um, again, just met, I just forgot to mention him. Um, great guy, very, you know, great DJ. He worked upstairs on the soul floor along with Ronnie. So Ronnie bounced between the floors because Ronnie was always, um, I'd never met him before, but he was very much into the soul music and the R&B and the funk um, and the boogie and all that stuff. But he was also really into his house music as well. So he would bounce between the two floors and steve wren i think i guess in the early days um i can't remember really excuse me when he joined us but um yeah steve wren was upstairs with big al and as i say ronnie would bounce between the two floors i'd be downstairs um and who else oh matt matt white so yeah matt matt was at catch a groove 
And uh, yeah, I recall, I think he came in, spent some time with us. I don't think he was there for that long. Mm-hmm. But he was, uh, an, he was another, another nice there, guy. There was a, a, a large, not a large, but there was a, a flow of different DJs through there. Maybe we'll get to them along the way. So I, I can think of four names that I'm sure we're going to get to as the time progresses. Well, absolutely. And I've got, a, yeah, and there's uh, Andy mentioned about the what, changing the way music was presented and having the list index. There's a bit of a story behind that one. <laughs> okay. So so there's a guy called Jimmy, Jimmy Mack. Um, mm-hmm. Again, another DJ. He might even pop up in the feed at some point. He's, he's a good guy. He was working for a company who installed sound systems. Um, and through my contact with him, I got him to put us in a, a decent sound system. If we're going to open and compete with Black Market and the rest, we, we need a decent sound system. So we had these massive speakers um, and it sounded so amazing, um, but it, it did cause problems because the building that we, we were in had a, um, a two floor apartment above and they owned the whole building. So they were leasing the downstairs to us and they didn't like us pretty much from day one. <laughs> um, I think one of the things they said to Izzy when, when we first opened were, what sort of record shop are you going to be? Are you going to be the noisy or are you going to be the quiet type of record shop? We were definitely the noisy type of record shop um it sounded incredible but it was way too loud and uh and we pushed it and pushed our luck so we had a visit from the council noise abatement team and uh they told us to to behave ourselves and turn it down in no uncertain um, terms well, think- ian is sending a call out for ronnie ian i'm fairly certain ronnie's on air at the moment so otherwise he probably would be here <laughs> so we got a couple of warnings i believe on paper from the council and then the final straw was um, was then basically coming down with a van and taking away the speakers. <laughs> really? Wow. So they literally turned up one day, yeah, and said, that's it, you know, you've had your warnings, we now take away the system. So they, they took away the speakers. And we were, oh, fuck, well, what do we do now? We've got, we're a record store with no sound. Um, so we quickly, Jimmy again, hooked us up with some pit speakers but more downsized much more small uh smaller um and we went and brought some technics decks so we put a lot of technics decks out with their own little tiny mixer and um headphones and i think most record stores probably had a listening booth at this stage you know as well as what was being played in the store but i guess we were one of the first to really go to that extreme so we must have had about half a dozen maybe maybe more um technics decks all lined up with headphones um and it was brilliant because, you know, it, it, it's kind of obvious, really. But if you go to a store and all you're listening to is whatever they're playing on the system at the time, you're only listening to one track. But we could have one track playing in the background and we could have another six tracks being played on the, you know, people could just listen to whatever they wanted. So that that increases sales. It, mm-hmm. make, it's, it makes total sense. And it was just, it was forced upon us. But that really worked well for us. Good. And um, I think... I think a couple of the stores sort of called onto that and started adding more decks after that. But, uh, you know, I laugh when I, I remember well the, the the visit. I think they even had a policeman along just in case, you know, we'd give them so, any so grief from the council guys. It wasn't your uh, amazing knowledge and vision. It was just like, oh, No, I'd love to you? say that it was me <laughs> being a marketing guru or whatever and, and saying this is the way forward. But, no, it was forced upon us. We, we came up with a solution which was just – just great okay you only, only about- downside was people would nick the cartridges we right. had a number of uh scallywags that would uh come down and ask to hear a tune and they'd quietly un- unscrew the cartridge and then do a runner up the stairs Look, izzy was pretty pretty quick and um i think he caught up with a couple <laughs> <laughs> dodgy dodgy southerners uh put them down t- the alley took in a dodgy southerners Good afternoon, yep. Mickey C. How are you, sir? Um, so you mentioned about the other stores following suit. Quite a harmonious relationship uh, with all the others, uh, apart from downtown. There was a uh, there was a very close um, camaraderie with Black Market, right? I don't remember hearing rumours of any bad blood. No, I, I don't. I don't remember there being any issues. I'm absolutely sure they would have been pretty upset the first, you know, to begin with. But um, it brought, you know, brought people extra people to the uh, to the street people would bounce between the two stores so mm-hmm. people would go to black the, the black market fans would go to black market pick up their records and then make a trip to us and then they might go around the corner to 
you know, where, wherever people would do the rounds because Soho, as you know, is not a massive area and all the stores are within a few minutes walking distance. Um, so I don't think it was an issue. I mean, I don't remember not being able to stock any Azuli records, for example. And for those that might not know, Azuli was Black Market's label. The office was above the store. And we 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 sold their records. And I don't think there was any problem at all. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So and, then, and mu- musically, we were a little bit different as well, I think. I think, I, I, you know, I don't want to... We didn't, we didn't take over the void left by Kachagoo by any means. They were... They were that was a great store, but we, we did, I, I certainly lent more towards the soulful vocally stuff. So I was a big fan of that type of music. And I guess that, um, uh, would have affected what I was buying into an extent. And I, whilst that sort of stuff was stopped by black market as well, I always think black market has been a bit more of the trackier type of stuff, you know, and, and maybe I think they just had a slightly tougher edge to some of their stuff. And then People of course might, with the drum and bass, but, the drum and bass was crazy. Yeah, absolutely. For, for so they market. had a drum and bass floor, which was, you know, huge. Um, and whereas we had an R and B floor. So we weren't, we, we were kind of complimentary. I'd, I'd like to think. And side by side as well with, um, well, a little around the corner, released a groove. It was more on the same kind of level musically. Of course, yeah. So released released the groove, which was the sort of southern end of um, Soho. Um, released the groove was pretty much the catcher groove team. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they 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 opened up and they did what they did. We all just did. We all just got on with it, really. Okay, so I I will take the pressure off you to try and remember every DJ that worked behind the counter, because I would hate for you to miss someone out and uh, feel bad for it. But people that I remember, oh, yeah. Spencer, Spencer Parker, uh, yeah. Aiden, uh, Hook, um, that's that's off the top of my head. Now I'm going to feel bad because I'm sure there's many, many others. Do tell well, me there's one more. in particular you missed, um, Seamus, Seamus Hardy. Well, I was thinking Seamus, and then I thought, no, I'm getting Seamus mixed up at release, but I'm thinking of Jeremy at release. So, of course, Seamus, yes. No, she- yeah, Seamus was there for quite a time, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, I think he came to us because he was working at Slip and Slide, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. And I think he may have come to us from Slip and Slide. I can't remember the order. Um, Tim Deluxe. Okay, I forgot about it, he, Tim. Yeah, so he was there for for a, quite a quite a time until he really started to blow up. You know, I can't remember that time when he's he was doing really really well, and he left to pursue that. So was he um, there all else? through the R.I.P. era? Uh, yeah, I think. Oh, well, he must have question. been really if he, until he had his solo career. I think he was. Yeah, I think he would have been. Yeah, he wasn't. I don't think he was a full timer. I think he just did a few days. You know, some of these guys just came in and did two or three days or one day a week. Uh, But Seamus was pretty much full time. And Iden, and for those that don't know, Iden is ATFC. Um, He was, those guys were certainly full time. Mm -hmm. And so was Spencer, Spencer Parker. Yeah. And they've all gone on to do, you know, great things. We had, yeah, we had um, a guy called Joel Chapman, which uh, was a friend of mine who was just, well, when he first started coming in Uptown, just this young kid who absolutely adored the music. Um, and he came in on board later on. Uh, Joe Mills, who was some of the sort of London heads would 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 remember. Um, oh, God, who else? Um, for a while, we had uh, a lady called Hilka. Uh, mm-hmm. She was just Jaws producer at that time when he was on Kiss. Um, she came and worked with us. So, yeah, so I was there pretty much through the whole of this, and then these people would come and and go. <laughs> did, but you it was have a great... any, did you have any okay. say in the hiring and firing? Uh, yeah, I certainly they would yeah, I certainly would have had a bit of a say. I certainly was very um I played a big part in getting Iden on board. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I remember going, I think he joined he he got offered the job um just before he went to Miami, and I can remember being on the beach with Iden and him just saying, Oh, I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. And thanks for hooking me up and stuff like that. So I guess I, I remember that quite well. Um, just the two of us in the surf chatting away. So I guess I would have, um, I would have had some played some part in that. And I'm trying to think how I would have met Iden. Cause I think he was, I think I might've met him through bump and hustle or something. Maybe I can't remember. Right. Okay. Well, there's so many, so many stories, so many twists and turns in the times 
down there, um, of course, at Uptown, and we're getting people coming through, uh, throwing some names in, and uh, Cass, Cass Rock in Nottingham, good evening, sir. Um, so I, I guess that's going to take us into the back end of the 90s, into the year 2000s. Before then, um, <sighs> broken memory, I know there was uh, Uptown Promotions because I actually came across um, uh, a promo sheet the other day in one of my records. Was there ever an actual label, an actual record label? I don't think there was ever an Uptown Records label, but there were a few things that we signed, um, particularly more on the UK front, the UK garage front. There was a, a few things that I think we may have pressed and there's a good chance that possibly the logo went on the press in. I don't know. That's probably as far as it went. Okay. I can't be sure. So from the promotions, yeah. so the 4-4 promotions, that was much later, right? Yeah, that was a little bit later. So by this sort of time, um, Uptown is quite established now and it's got a good reputation. Um, I'd been to Miami, I think, three or four times with t-shirts and hats and doing all the, you know, doing all the promotion. And, and it was, it was pretty established and pretty well known. And we had big names coming through the door. Lenny, you mentioned, I think he's online now. He was, he was in the store a lot. Um, people walking through the door would be, um, you know, Sanchez, Murillo, mm -hmm. CJ McIntosh, um, Dimitri, Grant Nelson, you know, all the London heads would be there. Ramplin. Um, let me think. Brian and Mark from Sulfuric, Dino and Terry from Canada. Any time people came into into town, you know, flew into London, they would they would come by and say hi. So there's a constant stream of big name guys coming in to pick up tunes, and that was that was really good and great for people that um, our customers. You know, it was great for a customer to walk to come to Uptown on a Saturday, come down the stairs and. There's, you know, Roger Sanchez or whatever popping in to say hi. Bar Barbara Tucker um, came along. She would often pop in. I think she did a, like a little PA once. <laughs> sang I, wouldn't down it, I wouldn't put it past her. Yeah, I, she did. I, Barbara's beautiful. She's she's just so amazing. Um, Byron Stingley certainly did because one of his songs had been signed to, was it Manifesto? Yeah. Um, so he came down and, and, and sang in store and did a signing um roger played twice at uptown um the second time i think the first time must have just been unannounced but the second time we actually put the word out um and it was it was heaving i mean you know uptown wasn't a big big space it was absolutely heaving down there um and we had people on the door holding stopping you know people from coming in and <laughs> there was a bit of a traffic issue because people were on the street talking and it, yeah, it was just, it was incredible. And somewhere somebody's got a recording of that. Um, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Should that I, was actually, I... sorry, that was, that was, so that was around the time another chance was really starting to blow up for him. Mm -hmm. And he had the whole album project going. He was doing things with Simon Dunmore and defected. Well, I was going to say that was, wasn't that the first or second release on defected and the chance. I don't know where it comes think, in terms I think of it release, may have been. But it, it, it would have been anyway, early days. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, early I days. do for some reason because of my connection with them. I have that in the back of my mind. Uh, but I may yeah, be it would wrong. have been. Yeah, uh, early two thousand. Yeah. So Chris Warren is here. We're going to talk about Chris very shortly. Uh, Sean Excellent. Samuel says, "Can you thank Paul as he is responsible for my poor credit rating? I go as far as to say at least fifty percent of my record collection comes from that basement. That's some well, accolade, right? I'd like to say thank you for your contribution, but it, it didn't go in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so um, I think we've covered the the the, the, the main." um basis of the, the history of uptown is there any anything else that you think we we should no, talk just, about just before we start going to back talk to about what it? you were saying about was there a record label so i, I again we were yes, signing sorry. you know there were a few things that would that we would have certainly i think pressed uh there would have been i think more on the uk underground sort of sort of tip um and there were there would have been a time when i was promoting a few things as well and that may have been called uptown promotions i really can't remember but that was the i guess that was where the whole 4-4 promotions 
thing came from. That was um, the foundation. I definitely, literally, last weekend, I found uh, something, and it had Uptown Promotions. It had the Uptown logo on there with your name on. So that's, there you go. Yeah. yeah so 100%. that would have been the catalyst for it, really. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually forgotten that. So the way that mostly came about is Brian, Brian and Mark from Sulfuric, um, great, great guys. Um, they always came to came into the store whenever they were in London. We'd go out and have dinner and we'd go to gigs and things together and we'd hang out in Miami and they were putting out a lot of music and um, they asked us to, to look after their, their promotion, which, which simply means you get some advanced copies of the, of the, of the records and you just make sure they go to the right people and, and get played and you get some feedback and then you, you know, tell them how it's going pretty straightforward. And, and, because I was at Uptown at the time, I guess it, we I did it through Uptown and called it Uptown Promotions. But um, that started to that started to grow. More people took interest. Other other labels. So eventually, I decided to 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 set up a promotions company on my own, and that's where Four Four comes from. So Four Four Promotions, uh, which started just prior to actually leaving leaving Uptown, and this okay. was probably about the time. I was then, yeah, I had my website set up by then. And that was when the forum was just starting to, to take off and, and you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. 2002, 2003, 2004, literally just around the time that I moved to Spain, actually. Yeah. 2000 and certainly 2002, 2003. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I have promotions. vivid memories. I have vivid memories. We didn't have a telephone we didn't have internet. So I would take the kids to school and then I would literally be sat for like three or four hours on the forum, just chatting nonsense, downloading music, the promos I was being sent, waiting to pick the kids up before I brought them home to give them dinner. So I have very, very vivid memories of that era. Sorry, Paul, I cut you off there. Well, as you know, there wasn't, um, so there was, there was no real social media then. Um, so, and, and I, I was, I wanted to pursue more, D, you know the, the DJ side of things. I wanted to push, and I needed something. So I, I there was a guy called Alex who were also worked at Uptown, um, who was a bit of a you know a techie geek. He wouldn't mind me saying that. I'm sure I knew nothing about websites. So I got him to build me a very basic website and teach me the basics of how to update it. Um, and I decided to 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 get some interaction with people to set up a forum. And forums were really quite big then because there was no other way of really talking to people. There was no Facebook or anything like that. So the forum was just an addition to the website. The website was a chance really for me to list like gigs that I'm playing at, tracks I'm playing, just really, tr- you know, just having a a face out there on, on the internet. Um, and and the forum just, it just blew up really mm. quickly. And it well, was we've just got, we've got a few people passing through here. I'm going to keep drawing reference to them. As you know, I like to um, let these people Absolutely. know that we see their comments. My yeah. good friend from Swindon, uh, Mr. Nick Ferro, he says the Ferris Forum and 44 was a big inspiration to start a monthly house night at the Brunel Rooms and Soda. Uh, big up to Paul. And I'm fairly certain that 44 broke the shapeshifters and Lola's theme. Um, Phil Gifford from Wobble, Birmingham, amongst many other things, he's passing through to send you some love. And uh, oh, great. and Danny44 is saying the forum was such a great platform for networking. And the funny thing about the forum is I still refer to people in my own mind by their forum names. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> I know crazy. It's, it's crazy. And those were the ones that actually used their names. I know there were a lot of people behind the scenes that didn't use their names. And I'm talking big names. You know, there was quite a few you know, big established DJs that were actually on the forum, but they use pseudonyms just to, um, just because so they, they like to come on and, and kick up a fuss and, and be quite yeah, controversial. Yeah. And it was a great, it was great. We had just a, a general chat space. Um, we had a, I think a, a space where people could tell, you know, share what they're listening to and where they may be doing their play in. So it was also a chance. No, it wasn't just about me. It was a chance for other people to other DJs to go on and say, I'm playing these tunes and you can catch me here this next weekend. You know, it was, uh, it was good. And I got a lot of love through the forum mm-hmm. and, uh, and people would be on there for hours, you know, all times of the day and night. I think at, at its peak, oh, look, it was certainly something like 20,000 page views a day or something like it, it was getting, 
Um, you know, the statistics weren't as com- as as, as um, in depth as they are these days. But so page views was usually the the the, the way of seeing how busy something was, and it was pretty big. And um, certainly now, if I, you know, I didn't make any money from it, but certainly knowing what I know now, I would have probably monetized that in some way and made 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 put some banners up or just well, made you, you say you say it. that it is very easy to look back with um a different outlook and a different uh idea of how things could have been better but you were really setting the stage not you yourself personally but you were at the forefront of this uh you know the the expanding of the technology and the communications and then slowly but surely eventually the likes of myspace would come onto the scene and and that was kind of like the death now for the forums but for many many years uh, you know, it was the way for people to communicate so much so that eventually you were able to create nights, record labels. So tell us about all of how all of that came about. Um, events. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we had uh, there was there were so many good DJs um, involved and um, posting on the forums and, and becoming, you know, the friends, but we, we met people from all over certainly the country and, and over the world through the forum. So I think we, we got the opportunity to do, um, to take, do like a forum party at the ministry. I think we did maybe two. Somebody will be able to tell me or remind me. Um, and I think we just invited people to come along or maybe we did a, we asked people to submit mixes. Again, I, I'm a bit rusty here, Andy, I'm afraid. But we certainly did some events and gave the forum DJs or people that were on the forum the opportunity. I don't really want to call them forum DJs. But we gave other people the opportunity to come along and play. Um, and we had, some, we had some great parties, you know, really good fun. And Chris, Chris Warm, you know, he, he, was, a, he was awesome. And he played a very big part in in the forum he he was he was like looking after things and monitoring things for me um he was um he he was playing at some of the gigs and and um coming down to uptown and spending his his hard-earned cash um great guy Mm -hmm. well chris had said when i mentioned about doing this conversation he said you know he was a big part of the forum I said, okay, what, what name did you use? He's like, Chris Warren. I was like, sorry, <laughs> I, I only remember the controversial names, the ones who used yeah. to have, like, public fights for, like, four or five hours. They were the best. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, um, yeah. It, it got the, 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 the thing with the forum, it almost got, it almost got too big, and it, it got hard to control. I, I, was, I was really busy with 4-4 with four, four and – organizing other things and i guess i wasn't it got to the point where i wasn't on there all the time um chris was would have certainly been looking after things but it just it just got quite big and there was a point where where people started you know posting a few yeah just just not really being community minded if you know what i mean um that 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 often happens when you get these sort of social networks people um go off on a tangent and it just gets a bit crazy. So there was a point where it got out of hand and there was a point where we decided to close it. I guess from, from an outsider's point of view, it was quite humorous to see sometimes the, the, uh, the aggressive nature and some of the, the, the backbiting, but I guess when it's your baby and as you say, this isn't in the spirit of what we want the Ferris forums to be about. I guess you then yeah. you think you know what now let's, it's time to pull the plug and of course uh, at some point we need to give a mention to your fantastic partner who was helping you uh, behind the scenes all the way right throughout all these times. Absolutely. So, so yeah, Mel. Mel was um, I met Mel when I was still at Uptown. We we met through through clubbing really ministry. She was buying records out of out of Uptown. Um, and uh, yeah, very much involved. She she's she's amazing. Um, and four four was was our baby. She was she was working at the time, um, and I was running four four from from home. We had the forum going on, um, but she was very much yeah, very much hands on, and responsible for quite a few things as well, like you know house music awards, which I'm sure we'll come to in a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, very hands on. Uh, we you at. 
at uh, some point, I guess we should talk about you yourself being a DJ, getting to travel around and, and uh, you know, represent your sound. Did you ever get to the, the point that you you think you could have or were you always focusing on other aspects of, of the music? No, I, look, I, I love the opportunity to play music for people and I was very lucky. The, the, I, had, I had a great solid reputation for Uptown and that was a springboard to, to a lot of gigs, especially in London. So things like uh, Satellite Club, Garage City, um, uh, down on the South Coast, Bump and Hustle with Bob and John, uh, The Manor, Seth and Cy. Um, you know, there was a lot of things going on. And then obviously as things grew um, and I started doing 4-4, that's, that just reached out a whole new audience. And um, and then and then the... You know the the great thing about the website and the forum was that the, that was then global. So by this time, I was I was I count myself very lucky. I was doing um, quite regular gigs in London, things like you know ministry. I was doing a lot of things for defected at ministry as well as playing there occasionally myself. Um, God, let me think. Um, Chris is asking, what was the furthest gig that you did? Maybe Sao Paulo. Yeah, how did you know about that? Did you, <laughs> Chris? That, yeah. Chris Warren's asking you this. I, I, I oh, think oh be Chris said that, Ali. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, let me think. Uh, Hong Kong, I think. Well, so, I don't know which is the furthest from London, Hong Kong or Sao Paulo. Um, but I remember going to Sao Paulo and and getting there quite early, um, and not really having the opportunity to do anything. So I remember a lot about that gig was that I, I was put in a hotel. It was a nice hotel. Didn't understand what was on the TV because I couldn't speak the lingo. Um, and being told, you probably don't want to venture out and go for a walk, you know. So being stuck there, just counting the hours and waiting to play that evening. Um, I did go for a sneaky walk just because I, you know, but I made sure I took my watch off and just went out. <laughs> and I had the exact same there. conversation when I was there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's 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 dodgy. or It, it can be. Um, so I went for a quick walk around um and uh yeah and then we had the, had the gig that evening and um it was good yeah and then flew back it was crazy it's a long way to go for a for, a, for one imagine, gig and a, Im imagine the people who do that week in week out it's a bit insane so you mentioned about the house music awards um I had completely forgotten all about that so you're gonna have to ah. uh, now now you mention it of course it comes flooding back but you're gonna have to tell us about how it came about so I just said how amazing my wife Mel is and, and how she's got very much involved and she was the springboard for a number of things and the House Music Awards was her her idea. Um, this was, um, let me think, 2000, so I'd left Uptown in 2003. 2004, I think, was the year we launched it. So I, I guess probably around the end of 2003, we were, we were talking about it and I can vividly remember driving from our place through Twickenham and we were talking that, about how the scene isn't doesn't seem to be getting a lot of love. There was a period, and I don't know if you remember, where I think a lot of there was a lot of tougher music starting to be played. I don't want to label it, but but it wasn't really the sort of stuff that we particularly liked or we were used, you know, I like to play. And I was noting a bit of a shift, but I was noticing that there just didn't seem to be a lot of love for the the stuff that we loved. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what we felt. And um, we we uh, we we thought that it should be celebrated in some way. And Mel said we should do a House Music Awards and celebrate it in that way, you know, and give props to the people that make the music and support and all that. I'm just I reading. In, I'm just reading in the uh, big fantastic for Mel. Sorry to cut you off. Finish the end of the story there. I'm just reading in the comments. Prue is saying I was there in 2004. Now that makes me realise. I was there at the first one as well because I'm fairly certain Timmy Vegas did a, a live PA with Barbara Tucker at one of them. Am I right? Or is that a different At the House Music Awards? Yeah. No, I, I don't Pre, think Where was Tucker's. that? Where where did Timmy, where we went with Timmy and Matt and he performed with Barbara on the stage? What year was that? Anyway, cut back to know. you, Paul. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking so, to, to just private conversation with Prue and I. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so we had this we had this idea or Mel had this idea. Um, and what, what we decided to do is we would create a website 
and we would give people the opportunity. So if we had a category, for example, let's say best track, we would give people the opportunity to say or what they thought their best track was. So we didn't decide. We we decided on some categories, but we didn't decide didn't decide on the nom- nominees. Um, so we put up this website and we gave people the opportunity to to you know fill in the gaps if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and we I think there was a three month period, and then there was a guy called David who was doing all the back end stuff for us. Um, and he would then collate all the information and give us the nominees. Um, so I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, we got a bit of, we, not everyone loved it. <laughs> we got a bit of grief after the event. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but we weren't responsible for the nominees. So, so the, but, the, but saying that the, the nominees were people in our sort of genre because we were the ones shouting about it. You know, of course, of course. So it felt oh, like it was a little bit of a boys' club. Yeah, right yes, um, and so we were talking, telling everybody. And as a promotion, we went to um, in two thousand and four. We went to Miami, went to music conference. It was a bit of a regular jaunt for us, and we decided that that would be the launch, and that would be the. the so throughout that whole period of of time, the uh, the conference, uh, we were walking around talking talking it up, and we were giving out white uh, white wristbands. So these these wristbands were white because they were like uh, we we were endorsing a charity that I can't remember. I should do, but I can't remember what it was. There was a charity, and their their thing was white white wristbands. So we so we did something with them. So we gave out these wristbands, and it had the HMA's I think uh, website address on it. And we were going around the radio one party, and basically all the events, and every and taking pictures. So there's loads of pictures of big DJs holding their arms up like this with the, with the wristbands on um so we did we did the promotion and then came back and um and the numbers were great people were it was really starting to gain momentum um so once we had our our um our nominees then we opened up the voting for the nominees you now vote for your nominees um and and i can't remember the stats but again it was it was pretty big and we decided that we would have a a night at um neighborhood so neighborhood is in West London, Westbourne Grove, near, just off Labrick Grove. And it was the club that was owned by Ben Watt from everything but the girl. Mm-hmm. It was his club. I, I think he owned it in a, with another fella. Um, and that was going to be the event. And um, look, it was, it was, it was massive. <laughs> it was just so big. We, it was a Thursday night. Um, it was absolutely round. We had a, we, we had a, big guest list but we could we needed to make we spent a lot of money on this we 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 personally put up a lot of money for this one um we had dj flights and dj hotels and just just press stuff there was just so much going on we had a big guest list but at some point we had to cap it because we needed some paying customers to come in as well and it was full the house was full um and it was an incredible night absolutely incredible um I'm yeah, fairly, fairly certain strange. that is the night Timmy Vegas performed, and uh, but anyway, by the by, there's a lot of people here commenting San Jose Pogwash said he was there. So, so how many did you? Was it the one the the one year that you did? Or did so you we do did it? we did the first one the H HMAs uh, in 2004. Um, we had um, so we had real people there who, strictly speaking, weren't a house act, but they were just so amazing. They did they did a PA at the beginning while people were coming in. They were absolutely, you know, I love those guys and they were amazing and, and later commented that they thought the HMAs was something that really helped them help, you know, was a bit of a spring ball for them guys. Cause I think shortly after that defected signed them. Um, but everybody that's everybody was at the HMAs, um, you know, the whole of the defective crew were there, junior Jack, kid cream, Frankie knuckles, Dave Morales, Danny Ramplin, uh, Ben, what was there with Tracy just, you know, everybody was there it was an incredible night incredible night um it was recorded for radio one as well for the pete tong show okay um and i remember the day so we went we went when the hmas finished and we were absolutely exhausted we actually ended up going to aka for like an after party which was incredible um i think morales played a a set um and then we went home got some sleep and then I had a gig the next day and we were driving, me and Mel were driving up north somewhere. I can't remember where it was. And um, it was Pete Tong's show. So it was Friday, it was Friday night. 
And uh, we knew that they were going to cover cover the show and do it, do a piece on it. Andy, I couldn't believe it. They gave, I think it was about half an hour of Pete Tong's show to the HMAs. Incredible. Incredible. Just playing all the clips and, to, and, and talking about the nominees and what a great night it was. Sadly, Pete Tong couldn't be there because he was somewhere else. But it was, you know, the, the, the love for it was huge. <laughs> well, listen to this. Ian Leggett, I, I keep mentioning by his surname, sorry. Ian says, he's looking on the internet and there was a live performance of the new vocal version of some track called Strings of Life. <laughs> there was. And yeah, and I forgot. Yeah, you should have known that. <laughs> Mad. Crazy, you right? Know that? So, I know. Well, I've said this on many, many, many occasions. We forget more than we know. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I can't remember everything about that night because it was just, it was so, it was intense because we were running about like lunatics. Who's next on stage? Who's presenting? Who's, you know, and trying to find people in the crowd. Uh, we had Brian Chambers. Mm -hmm. I remember Brian Chambers, I was trying to find him because he was due on stage and I was running through the crowd trying to trying to find him and uh that oh, i was just mad it was mad but inc incredibly it was it was great and look i said there was some negativity after i'm not going to dwell on that but there were the knockers you know there were the people that then go oh the hmas it was all about the people they know and it wasn't really representative of the scene and blah 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 you know you, you can't do anything andy without people knocking of course honestly we, hand on heart we we did it to really showcase what amazing talent there was not just uk talent but global talent and we we put our money where our mouth was we 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 didn't we lost money on that event um and a significant amount of money but you know it, it was incredible and we would we would never we didn't regret it um right. and so it was just, just a one-off or did someone take it over yeah so well the idea years? was that it would yeah the idea is it would be a a, a yearly a yearly thing um but um we decided not to because we again we had lost a lot of money um and uh and we had other priorities mel was pregnant at this time um and we decided to to sell the brand so we had a bit of interest and the guy actually who was i think ben watts partner brought it who was the, his partner in in the club neighborhood where we had had the first one um he brought it and hmas two was at hammersmith palais so quite a big step up because the palais is a big venue I think you know what uh, I think that was the that was the one I went to with Timmy Vegas. Yeah, I'm quite quite possibly. Yeah, fairly certain yeah, no. that was the one that I went to. Yeah, I, I was I was there. I, I went along, um, and yeah, that's right. Because did you say Barbara played? Yeah, that would be. I the think one. Timmy and Barbara did a live PA of Cabbage Juice. Uh, we can do fairly fairly certain yeah. um, because if you and I. I you know, Ian saying about the new the vocal version of Strings of Life, I don't remember that at all. I would have probably wanted to be on the stage myself, jumping around in some kind of outfit, pretending to mix. Uh, anyway, by the by, so um, so yeah, carry on. Yeah, HMA two was um, it was it was certainly a little bit different to to what we had done. Um, it was it was a good event, but it was it was starting to get a little bit more commercial already. It had only been a year since the first one. Um, so there were elements that I, I, I wasn't, you know, so keen on, but it wasn't our baby anymore. So um, there wasn't a third one. So I mm -hmm. guess the second one didn't make a lot of money either. <laughs> so which that is a two, shame. 2005, you say? That was 2005. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised it didn't make any money. Hammersmith Palais is a massive venue. I would have kept it a bit smaller, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And of um, course, at the same time uh, as all of this is going on, we start to see the, um, the increase of downloads, you, you know, the, the increase of the uh, peer to peer sites and, and so on and so forth. So the, the whole landscape of the music industry was changing, right? It's yeah. It's starting to change by this, by this time. Absolutely. I mean, it, when I mentioned earlier that Roger played at Uptown in the basement, um, what, there was two reasons we sort of did that. One was because uh, Defected had their office just a few doors down um, and he was doing uh, stuff with them. But also um, Pioneer had brought out, you know, they were really starting to push the CDJ. The CDJ was quite new then. And Ro Roger was, I think, one of the 
pioneer ambassadors. So we had CDJs downstairs in the basement put in especially for that gig. And he was showcasing what he could do on those. You know, these would have been the Mark ones, I imagine. Um, but yeah, a few years later and um, a lot of people are starting to burn CDs and CD, CDs became, um, you know, what you regular installments in um, in most clubs. I can remember carrying my CDs to gigs when I first, because I also did some promotion for Pioneer and um, they gave me some CDJs um, and these were Mark 1s and, and special bags to carry them around. So I can vividly remember going to gigs and getting there early to set up my CDJs. And this was a real novelty just mm. so I could play some stuff that wasn't yet on vinyl or some acapella loops or something like that. So I was a, I was a big fan and an early adopter of that really really yeah. ahead of the curve well a, a little later oh, on just... I, I remember getting off the back of strings of life getting my first tour coincidentally of australia and because of the ex because i had quite a few legs of the tour the extra yeah. baggage costs would have been quite uh prohibitive so i took my cds and i remember feeling like a fraud just walking in with like a little cd while it you know so again uh very vivid memories of the changing times um, so I mentioned Australia. We will get to eventually how you came there. Before we do skip forward, are there any other parts of the the story that we need to talk about? So, so I guess after HMAs, um, we probably had a little bit of a break around that time. Mel, we went to Miami again. Mel fell pregnant, and it was around this time that Ministry approached me about doing a mix for them, uh, which was kind of cool. So they, they, I was basically doing a radio show for ministry. So I've been playing at the club. So I knew the guys there. I also, we had a four, four radio show called at the four, four front that I was doing. Um, and the guy, the guy there that was uh, working with the, on the label, uh, Matt, he, he he invited me to come in for a chat one day and said, um, look, we, we, we want to create and launch a brand new label. And basically they were looking for something that was kind of, I think their words were falling somewhere between what defective were doing and maybe head candy a little bit, you know, but certainly mm -hmm. more defective. They wanted, they wanted something cool, cool incredible, incredible but label. they wanted, they, they wanted head candy money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they basically. said, would you, would you be interested in doing it? So we want you to basically compile the CD, mix the CD and we'll work on a, a concept and we'll work on some uh, a name and all that kind of stuff. And this was great. You know, I mean, if you get asked to invite to do a mix CD, who's going to say no. Um, so I was really excited about that. So I, I went home and compiled a load of tracks and basically did some mixes just to give them an idea of the flavor that I would like to, to do. Um, and I remember submitting that to them and then them coming back and saying, yeah, it might be a bit too soulful and, <laughs> you know, not really what we're looking for. So I did, I, I went back and did another mix and, and basically they, they wanted, they want, I think they wanted the, a subsidiary of what they had, but they wanted to be a bit cooler, like, like defected, but they also wanted to the the compilation to include a lot of the tracks that they licensed. Um, which were tracks that I didn't really play. Mm -hmm. I guess by this stage, I decided that I'm going to do it anyway because I might not ever get asked to do a mix CD as well. And they actually offered me quite good money for it, to be fair. So um, we eventually got a got a, a playlist together, which was a mix of tracks that I loved. There were some tracks that we were involved in as well. Um, and then there were some tracks that Ministry had licensed, which were, I guess, more of a commercial, had a more certainly more of a commercial edge to them. Um, and I, I mixed the, the CD live and what we did and hardly anybody knows this, but with the tracks that were theirs that I didn't particularly like me and the engineer, we chopped out the bits we really hated. So, <laughs> so effectively, and no one ever noticed, but effectively all the, all the mixes, all the tracks or most of the tracks on that compilation are special edits that we just did. Because there were bits that we, we didn't like, you know, I, I forget now, but just cheesy bits. And we just chopped them out. So it made it more tracky. So, it's, mm -hmm. so, um, and, and again, so we're going to be talking about Chris Warren again here because we were trying to come up with a name for the, for the brand and for the, for the compilation. And we were knocking about names for ages. And Chris Warren was doing events called How Sexy. And I think he was starting to tire of it and it was starting to slow down for him. So I mentioned to ministry, how sexy what do you think of this and they loved it absolutely loved it 
So I got them talking to Chris and they brought the brand off him. And that was How Sexy. So I did the first How Sexy compilation and they um, they did a number of them. Um, and I think they did okay. But, mm. but I'm glad I did it. It was fun. Well, Chris is saying sexy soulful house music. And uh, also he's saying maybe now you can reveal a sample from your collab with ATFC. <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's, that's a private in joke there i'm sure yeah no that that's going back to the uptown days. so me and me and i've always wanted to do a track and i had a sample in mind that i've never told anybody what it was and um we went to i i didn't had a studio near twickenham uh so we went there with a the sample and spent a few days on it and uh we did a track and we we called ourselves Sher khan and the track w- was called jungle juicy funk and we did I think we did like 3000 white labels or some something around something like that. Maybe I can't remember. Um, and it did, it did. Okay. It got quite a bit of support. Smoking Joe was a big supporter. She, she um, rambling, loved it. There's a whole bunch of people playing it. It, it. it did pretty good. I've got a few copies knocking about if anyone needs one, <laughs> get them on discogs, get them on discogs, but it was good. But no, I don't, nobody has ever come back to me and said, this was the sample. So little challenge for you guys, if you want to, yeah, it's a, uh, it's probably a, Shere, Shere Khan jungle Shere, Shere juicy Khan, Shere Khan. So that's the um I think that's one of the one of the characters from Jungle Book, Shere Khan. Yeah. And because it was called Jungle Juicy Funk, that was the name. Um there was another Shere Khan in the US, another artist called Shere Khan. Um I can't remember if they got in touch with us and said, What are you doing? But we didn't do anything else under that name. And that, that was the only <laughs> track I've done. I but that's that. yeah, that's 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 that. Right, so you and Chris could be here talking all evening um, about Easily. many many different uh, scenarios. Yeah. So moving towards the back end of the 2000s, uh, at some point you decide that uh, a change of scenery is needed, right? Well, pri- yeah. So you're talking Australia? Mm-hmm. Well, let me just say prior to that, I did join Defected. Okay, so forgive me, forgive me. No. Thank you. I should let you tell me the story. I can't, I just can't not, I can't skip that bit. So, um, so this, the form had closed and the form, as I say, was, was really big when we closed it. And then I did the, 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 the compilation for ministry. And then, um, Simon, who I, who I'd known for a, for a number of years, got in touch and said, would you like to come and have a chat? And they basically wanted somebody to do some, um, you know, like um, online marketing, if you like. They were really keen on having a forum. Um, so I, I I joined them. And that was around, uh, let me think, 2005, I think. Um, so I joined them as, I, I forget my title, online marketing manager or, or something. So we had a defected forum, which never really blew up to the extent that mine did. I think probably people have moved on by that stage. I don't know. Um, and I, I, like, I, I got involved in most things online yeah it was a radio a radio show oh yeah i forgot yeah so they used to now you've said it all the pieces are falling into my mind as well i know i it's amazing (laughs) what you forget defected in the house was their radio show which was on ministry and i was i think one of the first presenters so i did a number of shows for them in the early days Mm. i was doing quite a bit with them guys you know they're a great team um i was doing um ministry for them doing a few gigs overseas for them occasionally they had a dj management agency upstairs um i was doing involved in their merchandise so in the early days they're early early some of their merchandise like they had um record bags and cd wallets and all those kind of things i was working on the design of those yeah this and was doing the, the- this was the original uh, D logo as well before they moved yep. on to the sleeve and the vinyl. Correct. Yeah, they, the original D, which was like a distressed logo, you know. Mm-hmm. So the, I don't know if you remember the the early CD wallets because CDs were becoming big a big thing as you mentioned. They're easier to carry than records. So we made we made these really cool CD wallets. They were grey and they had the D sign all across them. They were they were pretty good actually. So yeah, I was with them guys for for I think it was about eighteen months maybe maybe two years we moved to australia in 2007 Mm -hmm. but that that was the timeline that i had in my mind where did the dialogue begin about the big move um so mel was starting to we had had a holiday 
as as a couple out in Australia and had a great time. We'd also then gone over with Adam when it when he was very little, and we had a, again a great time. And Mel was starting to miss, um, I think, miss Australia. And there were things in London that she she wasn't overly happy with. Um, so we decided that you know we'd we'd give it a go. Um, I'd never ever in a million years imagine myself going to Australia that far away. I, I you know, um, but it seemed like a bit of an adventure. And I can vividly remember, and it's ridiculous saying it when I say it, but I can remember saying, "Yeah, let's let's do it. We'll go." We'll, um, about a year's time we'll maybe come back and then assess what we're you know what we're um gonna do ridiculous who go you don't do that we we sold the house we sold everything went over to australia our stuff arrived maybe two months later and it's still in the back of my mind i'm thinking yeah we're going we'll go back and then work out what we're going to do no you don't <laughs> it was great we um i we stayed at um mel's mum's place um she's got a big acreage here and a, a separate house like they call it a granny flat and we had that so we didn't have any overheads really we stayed there for free we didn't really need to to do anything initially so it felt like a big holiday so i had a number of months where we weren't doing much and and that was good for us i think because adam was tiny so he was running around the yard and well, i say the yard it's a few acres you know and just having fun and loving it and the weather's fantastic um and it's good yeah, we stayed. <laughs> right. So this is the beginning of a new adventure and we've still got some way to go. So let me continue to say thank you to everyone that is here. Whether you're on Facebook, uh, I've actually started to rebroadcast on Facebook now. I'd stopped for a little while uh, focusing mainly on the YouTube channel, but uh, it does appear that we have got a lot of people with us watching on Facebook. So thank you very much. If you want to go over and check the uh, full interview it will be available for you to watch on youtube only once we've finished here on facebook the video will no longer be available so check out uh, as you can see here youtube.com forward slash dj andy ward but we've still got some way to go stick around uh okay then so uh what what were your plans for a new life in australia what were you thinking so of doing I think initially I wasn't actually sure, to be honest with you. <laughs> I really, I really, I really wasn't. I think I was a little bit not tired of the music side of things, but you know, I certainly needed a little bit of a shit, a break. So I did, um, I did hook up some local local guys and, and did some local gigs in Brisbane, some small gigs. Um, James Russell, um, Jimmy, sorry, and Russell. Uh, got to say hi to you guys because you helped me out in the early days these are guys that got me some gigs and were playing the brisbane scene great guys um but i i i guess i i really i had photography was always a big hobby of mine in the background and i thought it was time to maybe have a little bit of a shift and maybe look at doing something photography related and then do the occasional gig and so music's still there but it's on the back burner if you like um and that was pretty hard to get into because nobody knew who I was here, a long way from home. So, and the Brisbane's the Brisbane scene wasn't exactly uh, friendly to soulful house to a degree, was it? Because at the at the same time that you relocated, I was actually going and spinning over in the valley, and I know the carnage that used to take place in the music that was being played. Yeah, so so Fortitude Valley is in the heart of brisbane city <laughs> and it's where most of the the clubs are and it, it can carnage i think is a good word on a saturday night for what it's like there it's um yeah it's a pretty crazy place and and yeah i guess look for a long time i was a little bit disappointed i i didn't feel that really brisbane really got or enjoyed the sort of music that i enjoyed and and i like to play what i like to play you know i mean I, without sounding like i'll get my head up my ass so i do i do i don't want to play stuff that i don't enjoy um so but these these gigs i i, I used to do they they were fun they were they were good fun but there there were there was few and far between so photography seemed like the next the next thing mm -hmm. um and as i say it always been a hobby so i'd always enjoyed it i'd um i'd do done some shooting for for defected um but my, mostly it was a hobby 
Um, and I didn't know what to do, Andy, to be honest. So I, I did a bit of everything, really. I, I, I remember doing some product photography for somebody. Um, I remember I shot two, maybe three weddings. You know, I wouldn't do that again. Um, some portrait photography, family photography, you know, just sort of trying different things and trying to make a bit of a, mo- a bit of money here. Um, and for a, for a brief per- period, I got a I got a job working at a um, a camera store. So there was a big camera store here in Brisbane that had a really good reputation. It was called Photo Continental, and it was it was massive. They had about fifty employees. Um, so it had a big camera section. It had a developing section. It had its own cafe. It was that big. Um, and I was there for a while and I wasn't really very happy with it or my, what I was doing there. So me being me, I decided I needed to try and find a better role within the company. And their website was shockingly bad. And there was no online marketing. There were uh, the, the biggest problem with that company was they were, it was really old fashioned, really, really old fashioned. And the website was shockingly bad. So I got talking to the guy who looked after the website. His name was also Paul and um, sort of tried to work my way into, into working in the back office, looking after the website, which is what I did. So we we set up a MySpace page and started doing some social posts. Uh, we started making a website that was a little bit more, you know, was nicer to look at. It was more informative. Um, so that's what I did. I moved from working kind of on the floor to working in the back. Um. And I was there for a while and they had training rooms downstairs um, where they would run photography courses. And, um, and there was actually another guy called Paul who used to do that. And uh, he was great, but he decided to go traveling around the world one day and just disappeared. So they had no tutor. Um, and they, out of all the people there, I was very honored that they asked me to step in. So they, they, they said, would you fancy going downstairs and running some of the courses? And I, I reluctantly said yes, because I, I'd never felt, comfortable talking in front of groups it wasn't really you know my thing um so i I decided i would do it but on my terms which is basically i'll 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 change the notes and i'll put myself together a little presentation connect the laptop to the screen and that kind of thing so i did it andy and uh much to my surprise i really enjoyed it and that was the start of what i do now really um Mm -hmm. i did it for for a while for them but I wasn't getting any, I was coming in early. I was doing rewriting notes. I was putting in effort and not getting anything back for it and, and feeling a, just underappreciated really. So by this time I'm a bit more savvy now with the techie stuff. So I went, I, I built myself a, a website at the time. It was called learn photography. So that was the, 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 the uh, URL it still is. Um, and I put some, some courses up and no joke within like two or three weeks people started started to book so there was a period when i was working for this store and also on the side doing the doing my own courses and workshops and uh one of the members of staff at the shop told the management did you know paul's doing these courses on the side they fired me straight away (laughs) a foreigner doing a foreigner (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, clash of interest. They weren't interested. Um, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to step on their toes. I wasn't selling it in their store. I wasn't doing you know any of that. I, I try and play the game, you know. But if they're not going to look after me, I'm going to try and look after myself. So yeah, so they 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 fired me. Best thing ever. Best honestly, because within a few weeks, I was earning more money during the courses than I was there anyway. So it worked out really well. And we're talking now about. Um, let me think. Um, Two thousand an eight and i'm doing it now still crazy crazy the path the passage of time has has gone gone so quickly so um the courses where were you running from always just running them from home so uh, so initially Uh, from home yeah Mm -hmm. so so we we live just outside of brisbane on what they call the brisbane bay side um and the downstairs we had it's changed now but we had a big double garage space so we converted this into a like a, a space that we could use um it was decorated really nice and people would just come to the house and I do a short course. Um, but the problem with because we live on the South side of town, people that live on the North side, it's a bit like London. People don't want to go from one side to the other. Actually, it's nothing like London. <laughs> <laughs> London's this and Brisbane is this, it's tiny, but even so people don't want to travel backwards and forwards. So I decided to, to, to do something more central. And there's a part of Brisbane, which I absolutely love called South bank. 
Um, it's right on the river, and it's uh, they've got the, the what they call the cultural area there where the galleries and things are. Um, and that's why I decided to do it because anyone can get there. Um, and I've been doing it there ever since. And the, the, the basic format is is a group of people book. We go into South Bank. We have a space there that we book. We spend the morning talking through camera functions and features and buttons. And then we go and have a pub lunch. And then we go out and we take photos for about four hours until it gets dark. And that's the core workshop that I've been doing solidly for probably close on 14 years, maybe 15 years or maybe longer. I, I lose track. Insane. Just a, a and, quick, a, a, carry, yeah. carry on. No, no, please. Uh, Delhi G's just popped in to say, hi guys, late Delhi. to the party. Um, a quick aside to what you were saying, precisely around about this time, I was in Brisbane when you, when you had those crazy floods, which is, I think it was about 2009, 2010. If, yeah, if that not, was crazy. Maybe before. And I yeah. think that was around that same area, uh, the, all the big uh, warehouses that were, were um, converted into beautiful apartments. Some of my yeah. very good friends are living there. Uh, so anyway, that, that's by the by. But yeah, I was there. I remember having to literally do the sandbagging to try and protect all of the properties along the river. Absolutely. It was, it was that, that, because we had another one a couple of years ago as well, but that, that, that one was particularly, particularly bad. Um, and it caused, yeah, devastation. And it was just a absolute nightmare. We, we weren't affected because we, we live high up on a hill. So excuse me, we're not affected at all, but our, our, the back of our house looks out over the port of Brisbane. Um, and uh, I can remember seeing the, the TV crew the cameras um helicopters going over overhead and filming the river from above and all the debris going down the river i can remember looking out over the back and seeing them and then having it live on telly you know um yeah it was crazy and it affected my courses and workshops because the area that we did them in was just completely wiped out mm, devastated so, so we had to find another venue but that's by and by you know um that inconvenience was nothing to what people had to go through losing their house and, and, and their possessions it was, it was a yeah, I, I yeah, do crazy remember time the, the huge national uh well the international call for aid for the whole for the whole of the region but we, we, yeah, we're kind important. of getting it we're getting away from ourselves here discussing this um so the family is continuing to grow um and what's mal doing in all this time um so mal's been working in the biotech industry so she works um, with companies that are mostly developing um drugs or treatments or, or for various things um particularly cancer now so she that's the industry that what she works in so it's it's very very corporate you know okay she's, so she's working and how how old is not so little man now um so my boy adam is now 17 mm. He's six foot and, and probably a half. He's quite a lot taller than me. So he's certainly not little anymore. And we now have um, a daughter as well. So she's she's 12. Mm -hmm. Crazy. So, and uh, yeah. a hint of a London accent on top of their Aussie accent as well because of nah. picking it up from mum and dad. No, not at all. No, nah, nah. I mean, uh, to be honest, I think my accent softened. People often pull me up for saying ridiculous things and... Um, I I hear it. I wouldn't say it's ridiculous, but I do hear the 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 uh, the little the, twang. the little tint every every now and again. Yeah, photo. Yeah, which I, yeah photo. I don't like that. I I, I don't <laughs> want to lose my roots. You know, um, Mel's gone back to speaking <laughs> quite Aussie. Um, the kids obviously don't really know any better. Well, it, it was Adam was one uh, when we came out, um, and my daughter's yeah was born here. So yeah, they're they're. Aussies through and through, really. Yeah. But it's it's funny because you know my my kids have been here pretty much all their lives, but they've still got quite strong Brummie accents. So let let's continue oh, really? with the story. That, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Let's continue with the story then, because on top of the courses um, and uh, the website continues to go from strength to strength, and I think that was how we we hooked up ourselves a couple of years ago. You reached out to you sent out a call asking for some help with your website i think and i said oh, i might be able to help you do you remember that yeah absolutely yeah so so um i forget what the problem was i think I it was remember. just something you wanted to add add something with the wordpress and being a wordpress guru myself yeah i offered up some help and then we just we just started talking um and then in recent times with my 
my venture into, you know, trying to focus on my YouTube channel, which I've had for a long time, but I've never really paid a great deal of attention to it. And then I realized that here's you with hundreds of thousands of subscribers, um, you know, loading content on a regular basis, really high up there on the, in, in the, the, you know, the photo genius network. So tell us about this. Okay, so just before I get into that, do you mind if I go and turn the aircon on? Because it's Please now do. the sun is well and truly up. It's starting to get really hot it. in here. Let me so just I'm just going to disappear for one second. Go on, mate. No problem. I'll say good evening to Pax. Uh, Chris is asking a question, which I'll wait for him. I mean, he'll see that when he comes back. Uh, scrolling back up, Richard White says um, t about Paul, even though I didn't know you personally, I was gutted when you posted the last entry on the Ferris forums. Uh, but good to see and hear you answering the question, where are they now indeed? Well, someone had said earlier on that Paul's legacy will continue because he is, without a shadow of a doubt, um, you know, a mainstay of the London circuit and uh, everyone that you speak to has nothing but great words to say about him while i'm killing some time if you are watching on youtube and you are enjoying this conversation then please do just click that thumb give it a like and um we have a whole heap of incredible conversations with more legends in the music scene that you can check out on the wall um in your own time so uh paul had to just go and uh, cool himself down i've actually been turning my air conditioning the heat on and off this evening because it's a little bit chilly here <laughs> oh really well here it's going to be i think it's going to be about 31 degrees today and it's already starting to warm up mm -hmm. um, and because i've got a couple of lights here you know in an attempt to make myself look better than i really do it's getting quite <laughs> hot so air cons on five minutes time it should be nice and cool in here there you go well Where I, were I, we? won't, I, won't, I won't keep you i won't keep you much longer we're just That's talking okay. about your journey into the uh youtube and yeah. um, the success of the channel so um by this i, I forget when i started doing this. the first tutorial i think was loaded uh, uploaded in around 2016 so by this time i've been doing the courses for some time and there's a number of different courses i do i don't just run one i do more advanced courses and sometimes we go off to different locations and do things so photo genius which was the company name was was getting quite established in Brisbane, but but unable to reach beyond Brisbane because they're physical courses. You have to come to them, um, and that was always a bit frustrating for me. Um, cameras were starting to get really good video functionality in them. So traditionally, cameras were steel cameras, um, but the video side of things was really starting to take off. Um, I was watching people, um, a guy on YouTube called Casey Neistat, who some people might know who's a bit of a guru on, on YouTube and just loving the sort of things that he was doing. And I just thought, well, I'm, I'm going to play with the video functions of this camera and I'm just going to see what it does. And I may upload a couple of videos and see how it goes. So I, I uploaded a couple of videos just for fun and then decided I'm going to make a tutorial video, which I did downstairs and put that out and see how it goes. And I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the process of making the video. I enjoyed the process of piecing it all together and editing it and just, just putting it out there. It was, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. So I did another one and another one and decided that I would just pursue this on the side and see how it goes. It's a, a way to reach beyond Brisbane. Um, the risk always when you give away free content is that people then maybe won't do your courses but but over the over time that's proved not to be an issue people watch the videos they enjoy the content they book the courses so it actually mm -hmm. you know has helped um but it took it took a long time andy and a lot of videos for that channel to really start to grow i can't remember exactly but i would say there was probably a year and a half of making videos pretty consistently like nearly weekly or certainly fortnightly with very little traction and then it just started to to climb, um, and once it starts to climb, it, it's yeah, it really it's starts to take off. Exponential is the word I think we're looking for. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, well, it, cracking content from uh, th thousands you. to hundreds of thousands to millions of views on some of them, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so for anybody that's not seen the content or the channel, basically, I I, I do free to watch video tutorials occasionally i do gear reviews but mostly it's tutorial based and it they they are aimed strictly speaking at the beginner um 
and and they they do really well so most videos could get anything i mean it's you know there's there's no certainty with youtube you don't know what what how video is going to perform till it's out there so currently a video might get 10,000 views which for me isn't a lot but for some channels certainly would be you know fantastic but i get videos that get 50,000 views 100,000 views and i've i've had at least i think it's two or three videos that have that have hit the million i think one of them is close to or maybe just clocked up 2 million views collectively i think i've had 20 million views mm-hmm. um and now there's over i forget the number i haven't checked the number for a while but 350,000 subscribers or something so so it's become part of the business now because of course, sorry about that. It's my dog. If you can hear her barking, that's fine. Um, because you, you know, YouTube is a is a platform in which you can put out content and make money. So it's now worth investing the time making the videos and buying the gear and all that kind well, of stuff. Uh, if you cast your mind back to the beginning of your YouTube journey, that's exactly where I'm at now. I'm enjoying the the creative process. I'm enjoying pick her up if you want, no problem. That's all right. I'm just gonna uh, touch I'm, in, just I'm enjoying the creative process. I'm just starting. And you say about beginners, I've taken a lot of of lot of uh, information and a helpful advice from some of your videos. Let me tell oh, you that's that. That's good to know. And uh, so yeah, you know, it's, it's just fun. I'm also uh, stuck at the moment in trying to just focus on what I want to do and at the same time as picking up information from a lot of these influencers, from a lot of uh, uh, educational channels, they always start talking about find your niche, promote this, promote that, find out what's hot. And it's just like, no, I just let me just carry on talking to my friends and let me continue to do these, you know, pulling records off the racks. I, I don't want to become famous off the back of no. making load of crap content because that's no good for anyone, is it? No, keep keep doing what you're doing because I, I personally I, I absolutely love it. I think it's I think it's great. And you can tell that that you love making it. That comes across. And I hope hopefully and people say this sometimes, you can tell that you love photography and you're into it. I, I try and be, you know, I, I make videos about things because I like I like it. I like photography. Um I enjoy it. I get a real kick out of helping other people work out what these buttons do and how to take great photos of their kids and their family and their holidays. I get a real kick out of that. Um, it's just an extension of what I physically do here with my workshops really. But you know, YouTube is, is I can't stress how amazing it is. I absolutely love mm-hmm. it. It's an incredible platform that anybody people think can get people on. think that it's at saturation points really, but really it's just beginning really, even though it's I, been so huge for so long, the, the, yeah. the, the, the potential is amazing. Right. Absolutely huge. Yeah, absolutely huge. It's the go-to for most people. If you have a problem, um, obviously there's a lot of entertainment content on there as well. And there's lots of crazy stuff that the, the kids like, but for, for a lot of people, if they want to know how to, you know, change a wheel, most people will watch a video rather than yeah. read how to change a wheel, you know, and there's videos for, for everything, absolutely everything. So if, if someone gets stuck on a camera function, chances are their go-to is to just type you know do a search on google which of course is going to lead them to a video because google owns youtube Mm -hmm. um and it's it's an incredible platform i mean i I get feedback and comments from all around the world from people constantly like i mean i mean constantly i can't keep up with the comments and the feedback i i I could have someone here almost full time just just doing that well i hope to uh i hope to have that problem that you have at some point in the future i hope hope Um, you do as well but the key thing is i think honestly you've got to like doing it because i think that comes comes across you know mm -hmm. oh i do with that that. absolutely absolutely love this and we've got some um, great guests to come some great guests in the past so let's start let's start uh summing up and rewinding and focusing back on the glory days of your time in the music industry yeah in in the uk because that's really why we we began this conversation because a lot of Absolutely. my my community my network will be interested in that and yet i think there's a lot of your new network of of friends around the world who will definitely have been interested to hear what a legend you were in the scene so um how do we recap you know what's happened to you over the last 25 30 years oh, look i I certainly wouldn't use the word legend. I'm just a, a guy that 
I've had some lucky breaks and I've I'm very lucky because I've pretty much career wise always always been able to do something that I really love doing and I'm really passionate about um you know I love music I love photography and taking photos and that's been my journey and I'm very lucky for that um and you know they haven't always been great money makers but for me it's I, I just like doing what I like doing um does that sound arrogant you know no I, no, no I think you I think you couldn't be any further away from arrogance if you tried because as I said when you were at some point or I said it in my head you would you would have to go a long way to find anyone that really could have anything negative to say about yourself apart from when you fixed the house music awards of course (laughs) look I I just remember I was a kid at school who loved music and was always going to the record shop and spending my money on records and buying ex jukebox records because I didn't have much money I don't know if you remember them Mm -hmm. um and then to, to leave school and go and work in the record shop was just perfect. And that's where it all began. You know, I'm now working in a record shop. I'm selling music. I'm listening to music all day. And it's great. And you just, and it's a progression from there. I've always, I, I get excited about music. So if I hear something I like, the first thing I want to do is go, babe, you know, to me, have you, have you heard this? Or, you know, or, I love sharing it. Um, I miss, I miss it. I miss when I say I miss it. I, m- I miss the opportunity to perform and play music. I, I do things occasionally here. So Stuart, who was chatting on on here earlier, he's a, he's a local lad from up north. Um, we do occasional gigs. We've got one coming up in a few weeks' time. Um, so I do get the opportunity still to play some music, but I miss those big clubs and I miss the, that that whole scene. I'm sure it's completely different now, anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'm at the point where I actually would be interested in maybe doing a radio show again occasionally. You know, I just I mm-hmm. think I would like that little outlet. Okay, well, the, 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 the technology is there. Obviously, you're you're perfectly set up to do something on, on Mixcloud or on YouTube. You know, a little yeah, little side it might channel. Be, it might be that. I think I think I, I'd quite like to do that now. Maybe a monthly show or something because because. I did. Um, I mean, the last time I did that, I guess, was when when the whole COVID lockdown was on and everybody was DJing on Facebook. Um, I I did a mix on Facebook, and I I, we, I had like a thousand people listened in or something like that. It was just it was it blew me away. I couldn't believe someone it. commented on that earlier. They were saying, you know, they loved your lockdown sessions. Chris Warren is giving you some love. He's saying uh, thanks for taking the trip down memory lane. And are you still using the stick phone? He asks. I am. And, uh, I've got proof. two. I've got two stick phones that he made. One that I use all the time, and one's my backup. <laughs> well, yeah. Pr- proof it. He says you came and played at a night that she put on. Um, it was a bit of a disaster, but you played her favourite track, "Beautiful People." Top geezer. And uh, Mike Brookfield is giving you love, saying definitely a legend. It's the right word, and you are a top bloke. So uh, links to your photo genius will be in the description on YouTube for people to Fantastic. click through and, and, and see what you're up to. Now we could quite easily sit here reminiscing all evening. Uh, I've got to say thank you so much because by. it's like what is it quarter to eight a.m. for you now? Yeah, so it's quarter to eight. Um, yeah. Yeah, the kids have gone to school. They were very quiet. <laughs> very quiet indeed. It was just yeah, the dog so they, that they, was giving us issues. Mel's out. She's at the gym. So, um, Brilliant. yeah, it's been great. i got to say, because you said earlier, you're, you're afterwards when you wrap up, you'll remember that you forgot to give people a shout and you forgot things. Just want to say hi to Darren Giles. <laughs> so he's a he's another mate of mine who, who recently has been doing some gigs and um, has been putting some tracks out. And he's always been a top fella and a big supporter as well so i couldn't forget darren a big fan i thought we had said hi to darren earlier because he was passing through i got a lot maybe of we darren. did but I, I, I i couldn't let it go so yeah give him some praise so yeah i mean there's no, there's no easy way to end a, a wonderful conversation like this other than to just say thank you mate and then at some point down the line uh i'll invite you back on if you can get yourself out of bed again and and we'll we'll have a conversation with some more of your uh record store buddies from back in the day yeah would love to mate it's been great and i I, thank you for the opportunity as well i was really feeling very chuffed and honored that you asked me because i'm in good company you have some great guests and it's a great show and just keep doing what you're doing because i i for one love it thank you very much my friend i'm just going to say goodbye to the people enjoy the rest of your day
Take care, man. Bye. Thank I'm you. Go, I'm going to I'm going to press this button. You're going to go now. All right. Okay, mate. I'll see you. One love, man. Take care. Okay, so Paul goes. I really, really enjoyed that conversation, as I enjoy all of the conversations. Um, definitely uh, a gentleman that we all know and love, and it's great to hear how wonderful he's doing with A New Life Down Under. Uh, thank you to everyone that is commenting. I will read some of the comments. as There's a little bit of a delay while it comes through. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, uh, next week, or depending on when you see this, I am going to be having a conversation with Norris the Bus Windrush and MC Creed. We're going to be talking about the UK garage history uh, and we're going to be sharing some love and knowledge on the uh, origins of the UK sound. So I've just changed my end of my screen and I completely forgot that I had all of those new little graphics flying <laughs> onto the screen. Uh, if you've enjoyed that, guys, if you did get any value from the conversation, then please do give me a like. It will help more people see the content in their YouTube stream and it will help the channel grow ever so slightly. Uh, if you would like to be notified the next time I go live, then if you would like to subscribe, you'll get a notification. Uh, and that means you won't miss out. So thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Chris, Ian. Uh, Paul logs in as his photo genius. So you can click on that comment in the chat and it'll take you to Paul's page. Do roll on over and give him a like and subscribe to his channel. Uh, Julie B, she says, thank you, Paul. Your story was very interesting. Julie herself will be um, a guest in the forthcoming weeks. And uh, I'll just continue to say thank you to anybody else that does comment uh, watching the recording. I have taken up a lot of your time. Thank you for your attention. I love these shows. Music, history. We also have some non-music conversations. Take a look on the wall. See what you may have missed. See you later, guys.